You're welcome back to Afia TV News and our conversation segment. Tonight is centered on Enugu embarking on the 260 type 2 primary health care centers. And in order to improve health care delivery and bring health services closer to the people, the Enugu state government has embarked on the construction of new 260 type 2 primary health care centers across the state. Governor Peter Mbasa, the state government, had taken significant steps at improving the health care sector, which would ensure increased access to quality health care facilities by residents across the state, regardless of financial status. The governor also said innovative measures that were being taken by his administration to transform the health care sector expressed delight over the federal government's interest and in the efforts of the sub-nationals to build a robust and resilient system. And according to him, the, mini the administration has already identified deficits in infrastructure, shortage of personnel or workforce, among other factors, as the major challenges facing productivity in the health sector in the state, saying the government was stepping up efforts to use technology and has already designed developmental templates to address the problems and make the system not only attractive, but also effective, efficient and functional. Well, joining me now to discuss this further is Professor Emmanuel Ikechuku Obi. He's the Honorable Commissioner for Health in Enugu State. Good evening, Prof. Welcome to the show. Happy New Year. It's good to see you. Happy New Year. <laughs> All right. So good evening, let, let's start off with your area of research interests, which are in health promotion, health communication, primary health care, and epidemiology. Do tell us a bit on how your research has impacted your ministry. Okay. Um, first of all, my area is uh, the public health medicine, okay. and um, public health medicine essentially yeah, deals about deals with everything that has to do with um, uh, the full spectrum of healthcare, from health promotion, um, prevention, uh, treatment, rehabilitation, uh, full spectrum. So uh, it's a field that allows you to. First, to be a clinician and then also be involved in management and be involved in administration and be comfortable doing all of that. Mm. So, research interests, health promotion, um, health uh, communication. For, for me, uh, there was a time when my uh, interest and excitement was all about on the issues of health management and health economics then. After a while, it became interesting to see that we needed to move a lot of the evidence that was being gathered from all that research on health economics and health management into um, the dissemination space where it will now be available to people to be able to make use of that information um, to be able to better their health outcomes. Okay. So that's why I was interested in, in that field, the scope of research. Yeah. All right. So. Let's talk about the construction of the new 260 type 2 primary health care centers across Enugu State and the universal health care coverage in Enugu at the moment. Now, how would this scheme, um, first off, be funded and how sustainable would this be even after the administration is over? Are there laws promulgated to its sustainability? Well, um, you see, uh, let me start by saying that um, uh, our governor, Governor Peter Amba, if if I stand to be corrected, but he's 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 one of the only candidates at the time who wanted to who was coming up to be governor, who I who for a long time or who I've ever heard use in his manifesto the phrase universal health coverage. So it's interesting because when you say what universal health coverage means is um, ensuring that healthcare is available to people when and where they need it and um, without financial constraints. And then it also gives you that full gamut of uh, or full spectrum in healthcare delivery from, from promotion to prevention to treatment to rehabilitation and all that. So um, universal health coverage you know, to have been used in a manifesto by a governor, you know, tells you that he understands, you know, the um, benefits of universal health coverage as I have defined. So 
um, one of the strong points of universal health coverage is ensuring that primary health care is available you know, to everyone. Because we said it's availability of health care, of, of quality health care, quality essential health care to everyone, you know, when and where they need it, and without financial constraints. Primary health care is the strategy, the tool that can really help you to achieve universal health coverage. So um, for the governor, it was more like um, he was prepared as he was coming into governance, you know, to be able to attack this universal health coverage team headlong. And then that is why he has started with um, primary health care. Now, the scope of healthcare services at primary level goes from the type 1 to type 2, type 3. There used to be old terminology of health clinic, primary healthcare center, maybe comprehensive healthcare center. Now, the, in the nation right now, there is focus on providing the type 2 healthcare services that, you know, where you have primary healthcare workers readily available in every ward. Now, it is a concept of having it in every ward that brought the number 260. So we're trying to achieve the basic essential healthcare services available to everyone in every ward in the states, 260 of them. And just like the, in other areas and aspects where we have seen that the governor has come in and hit the ground running, he has also done the same thing with healthcare. We can see he's talking about the smart schools in 260 wards. We're also talking about um, type 2 primary health care centers in 260 wards. And then there's the issue of water. And then there's the issue of roads. All this has, is happening how many days in office? You know, very few days in office, and these things are happening simultaneously. It just tells you that it's, it's, we're dealing with a development-minded individual who has come to governance in a new state. And on the issue of funding, yeah. we can be sure that he is prepared to do the funding you know, of these processes. Look Are there at, going to be partnerships and collaborations with um, probably the World Bank assisted funding or any other kind of funding, maybe WHO, UNICEF, those kind of health bodies that want to partner? Do you have such provisions and partnership with any good state? Yes. Okay. Now, beyond, beyond the budget and beyond what this, the state is going to fund by itself, there is the issue of partnership. There are a lot of partners. And, you know, the partners for health in the world right now are focusing on primary health care as the driver to universal health coverage. So when you have leadership in a state that is talking about universal health coverage, then you can be sure the partners will be interested in coming. So the partners are already knocking on the door, and they are already um, you know, uh, making commitments as to how they can help to drive this process. So partnership is a strong contributor to the achievement of universal health coverage through this primary health care structure that we are, we are working on. OK, so there's another part to that question where I spoke about sustainability. Um, you'd agree with me that everyone in Nigeria also believes that government is continuum, you know, should be a con um, continuity. And if there are no laws to probably guide and, you know, promulgate it to ensure the sustainability of these things, um, these things will just fade away, no matter how good the intentions of the governor might be. So um, what are the laws or where are you working on with the lawmakers in the Enugu State House of Assembly to ensure that the universal health coverage gets down to the nook and crannies of Enugu and the environs? Well, it will interest you to know that um, the laws in Enugu for achievement of universal health coverage have been in place since 2017. Interesting. Yes. So, so the what, what, was the, what was the challenges you had? Oh, um, the laws have been there, okay. and then the laws in itself have been in progress and has been working. Um, in the last administration, there was a lot of efforts towards healthcare infrastructure and the push. Um, um, our governor is consolidating on this now, and also going down to the grassroots to ensure that there is that ground up. Um, um, process in providing this health care from the primary health care. Now, while doing this also, we're not losing focus on the fact that we also want to make Enugu State the 
biological tourism capital of West Africa. So just as we're doing universal health coverage also from, from um, ground zero, as you might talk and bring, I might say, bringing it up, we're also looking at developing world-class healthcare services also. And um, the laws are in place. We have our health sector reform law of 2017 that has been in place in the state since then. We are recently reviewing, looking at it again, and then try to see how we can, because it's been, it's more than five years already. Every, every responsible um, state or sub-national or any responsible government should maybe within every five years start to review what, you know, the laws that they had in place. So our laws have been looked into again, but we have had these reform laws in place. And those are the laws that have been supporting the issue of universal health coverage and um, the provision of primary health care uh, that's available you know, to everyone, even on the issues of health insurance. And um, the, uh, com continuing to implement the law will really put in place sustainable health care delivery in any new state. Okay. So um, you would agree with me, sir, that one strong dilemma we face in the country today is the migration of our health care workers to climes where they're better remunerated. And um, you were, if I'm not mistaken, you took over as um, Commissioner for Health in Enugu State in the Uguayan's administration precisely on the 20th of April, 2020, if I'm not mistaken. 9th but, April. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> what's the government's plan to ensure that Enugu doctors are proper, properly remunerated and what are the incentives to stay back in Enugu? Because only a few days ago, Resident doctors at the Enugu State Teaching Hospital have announced plans to embark on an indefinite strike over shortage of doctors and insecurity in the state. So we'd like to know what the plans are to assuage them and then meet their demands, as government will always like to meet their demands halfway, I guess. Well, um, Enugu, in Enugu, our doctors actually are in a good situation, as we may seem, because... In Enugu, our doctors are, in their salaries are almost at par with what you get with the federal, doc, the doctors working at the federal level. But um, you see, the doctors, uh, they, have, they have issues that are plaguing them, and um, some of them are, in, uh, are touching on the issues of uh, their training because they are in the um, teaching hospital. Yeah, their residency training, programs. Residency program and their training. And, in truth, the, the, the state government is continually looking into their issues and making every effort to satisfy their, their pains because health is in focus for this government. So they are, we are consistently in talks with them and um, a, lot of, a few of the demands that they have made have been met and then efforts are in progress to meet a, um, a large number of the demands that they are making so that we will have a stable um, healthcare delivery system in the state. So the government is talking with them and making adjustments to be able to give them as comfortable an existence in their training as possible. Now, um, with, with that, we are still faced with the issues and the pressures of um, the Japa syndrome. Right. You know, people um, um, getting up and leaving you know, the shores of the country to um, where greener pastures, as the case may be. And the truth of it is that it also has pressure on the on health service delivery because what with people who leave, um, the health workforce starts to be stretched thin. And you have some more pressure on the ones who have remained. And it, it, like I said, the government is very responsive. Right now, there is um, a process where um, we're trying to even recruit more doctors. Yeah, in, that was my so question, my next question. Like, yes. what are the plans to employ more doctors? Yes. Because that's one of their grievances as well. There is an, there are, an advert has been in place since December, and um, people have, have um, responded to the advert, and then the applications and interviews have been held. You know, so soon that process will be over, and then people, um, and employ, employment will take place. and we would have more doctors in Essut to, um, to uh, reduce the pressure, you know, that is being faced by those who are there, consultants and residents alike. How about the insecurity? Mm. 
every effort is being made to ensure that the um, hospital environment is secure. And um, uh, I think a few of the things that have taken place that have touched on security is maybe the, um, maybe the discomfort that some patients or patients' relatives face, you know, and um, sometimes the, um, the uh, drop in the emotional stability, you know, between a patient's relative and healthcare personnel. So efforts are really in progress to ensure that this is reduced to the barest minimum. Security men are being hired, they are being trained, and um, to also patrol within the hospital and ensure that healthcare personnel are safe. So um, government is a continuous process, like you have said. So it's about communication, it's about interaction, and it's about being responsive, you know, to the pains of the people that you govern. And there is the side of the clients and the patients, and there is the side of the doctors. And government is making every effort to create a balance in between. Okay. Yeah. So before we go, um, there are some communities that are um, in Enugu, which I, I'm sure that maybe every um, government worker are conversant with these communities because when there are campaigns, um, politicians usually will go to these communities. So I'm speaking of communities like Bonka, Ugu Eron, you know, some slum communities and areas you have around MNA, Ababa, where there's a massive population. And I'm going to be speaking from the Bonka um, community where I had interactions with them recently, but there was no record of any healthcare centers. In fact, I was specifically told by the chairman that when their women want to give birth, they do it themselves, help themselves. Um, you know, so it, it's that bad. The situation there is that bad. There's somewhere up the hill at um, old UNTH there. So, but I'd like to ask, how does the government intend to reach these people? Though they appear to be in the urban areas, but they're somehow cut off from, you know, the city center, as it were. And these are, if you go to the places, you might be very interested in that community because there would be probably a surge of um, public health concern from there. There are no toilet facilities. It's an open defecation system altogether, and it's really in a terrible state. So how will the government reach these communities that are up the hill, you know, where you have um, no healthcare centers at all? Do you think that the Type 2 um, initiative would get there? Because I would love to see, and I will follow up on those communities as well. Well, the promise of the government is that the type two healthcare centers will reach every political ward. Now, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure which political ward the bunker belongs to. Okay. But it also happens to also be in the, um, within the city, you know? So the people there also have access to healthcare delivery, but maybe maybe the challenge here is financial access to healthcare delivery because from that area a little bit of transportation gets you to UNTH. The old UNTH. Old UNTH. Right. I, as I'm aware that some transformation is even going on in the old UNTH to get healthcare services available there. Now they are not too far from the new market area and from other areas. So I am aware that there are healthcare facilities there. And for whatever ward they belong to, they are going to get the type two primary healthcare center. And what we need to do also is to increase or improve on because you know we have been doing our health promotion activities to these places. We have to improve our health promotion reach you know, to them. Because if we're talking of health promotion, it's defined as um, increasing, enabling individuals to take a little bit of control over the determinants of their health. So, and health promotion, when you say we increase their control over determinants of their health, it's about they need to be taught about the positive health things that they need to do to be able to help themselves. Um, there's, a, there's a real strong point when you're looking at public health medicine. That's in where you push community mobilization. These people can be taught to actually do a lot of things for themselves. You know, like um, even in the 
construction of uh, very simple, very simple sanitary, you know, um, infrastructure like your ventilated improved pit toilets and, and so on. So it goes with a lot of, um, of um, interaction and communication. And it's not only for the health sector, you know, uh, several other sectors in, in the government are also working and looking into how, you know, these areas can be decongested. You know, we have our housing sector, we have the, gen, gen, the children, gender and social development, you have the environment and you have the health. Water as well. Water also. Mm -hmm. And I must tell you something about this government. This government is about the promotion of, um, of um, teamwork and partnership amongst us, the commissioners, so that within the ministries that we are heading, we are collaborating to ensure that a lot of these social ills are taken care of. Okay. So, but before we end the show, I'd like to thank you for sharing your thoughts with us tonight, Professor Emmanuel Ikechiku, the Honorable Commissioner for Health in Uguste. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. And I would particularly be looking forward to those communities because it's, it's something that I think the governor needs to look at himself. Uh, very often you find politicians going there and their votes are massive, but their infrastructure it's a no-brainer. So, but we're looking forward to the governor, Peter Mbass administration, to do something about these communities I've mentioned before. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you.